Uh, we talked about this mega week that we're having here in Hong Kong, really bringing in some of the top financial heavyweights to this city. What's going to be the pitch to them? Mm. Um, I think the pitch is very easy because Hong Kong has been an international financial center and we can continue to be an international financial center. And we have a lot to offer. Like, for example, apart from financial professional services, we have a vibrant society economy. And also we have a very vibrant art scene that's illustrated by the presence of Art Basel and many art events. So what you can see in Hong Kong is a very vibrant cosmopolitan epitomizing what Hong Kong has been and continue to be. You obviously have been tracking a lot of these family offices that are trying to set up an, a shop here. How is that going so far? Give us an update. In fact, recently we have an independent party doing a report on the number of our uh, single family offices in Hong Kong. And as recorded, we have um, 2,700 of them. And if you look at the composition of these 2,700 single family offices, there are uh, classified into four categories. And the top categories are those of AUM more than 100 million US dollars, basically take up one third of this number. And in that report, basically what we haven't counted is the multiple family offices. So if we also count the multiple family offices as well, I would say we have a very vibrant and also very crowded family office scene, I must say. How, how many of those are new uh, since you initiated these schemes back in 2021, I believe? I mean, are you confident you're going to hit that target? That, that John Lee said of 200 family offices by 2025. Definitely. Uh, if you look at what has been achieved since we had our first World for Good events last year, when we announced a host of eight measures to draw family offices here in Hong Kong, uh, we have helped through our investment entity, which is the Invest Hong Kong, the investment promotion entity, uh, around like 60 firm offices to station here. But that said, in fact, many other firm offices have been inquiring about our policies and also have been trying to sell family offices through their own means. Mm. So I would say the number which is actually landed in Hong Kong should be bigger. Obviously, we've been talking about the competition with Singapore when it comes to family offices. I mean, what we heard last week with the Article 23 uh, being fast-tracked into law, is that a concern among the wealthy? That, that you've talked to? Not really, because as highlighted by uh, David, also yourself, we have a mega event week. And also, if you look at how business has been going, it's very much business as usual. If you talk to many of these high net worth individuals or families, what they are looking for is ways to diversify the asset. And this is exactly what Hong Kong has to offer. Like, for example, in our Wealth for Good event, we have a number of themes. We have uh, luxury and legacy. We have philanthropy. And also, we have tech. And also, we have uh, sports as a potentially emerging asset class. The reason that we have this set up is that we look into ways to see how Hong Kong can help these family offices and family wealth to diversify into new asset classes and also continue to find value here in Hong Kong. I believe Dave has a question. Uh, yeah, Christopher, hi. David here. By the way, it's nice to see you in our studio. Sorry, I, I couldn't be there in person. We're busy here, of course, all at the Milken Institute uh, Investment Symposium. Yep. I guess my question for you would also on family offices. I think about a week and a half back, you know, a relative of the Dubai royal family came to Hong Kong. You probably know they're setting up a half a billion fund. And I'm wondering how much traction you think we will get between, along this Hong Kong, greater China, Middle East corridor, which seems to be gathering a lot of, you know, a lot of momentum. I've got, certainly we've gotten a lot of uh, queries from the banking sector, from, 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 from people looking, for, looking to place talent, for example, as it pertains to the business from the Middle East. If you could give us a sense of what you are seeing on the ground. Mm. Um, as you rightly said, uh, we have a host of measures basically to grow Hong Kong as a family office hub. And among them, first of all, is a tax concession. At the same time, we have a capital entrance scheme, basically allow people to have 30 million Hong Kong to come to visit in Hong Kong and station in Hong Kong, and also to be RPR. And in fact, all these measures added together is very much reflective of the very nature of Hong Kong, which is a very diversified and cosmopolitan city. And again, this backdrop, we have been working closely with many of our Middle Eastern counterparts. Like, for example, my bureau has signed an MOU with the Dubai Economic Cooperation Corporation right. with a view to have cross-referral of family offices. And, of course, as an uh, international hub, we welcome family offices from across the world to set up here. Right. Now, Christopher, it's one thing for family offices to come and take that money and domicile that money into Hong Kong. It's another thing to keep that money in Hong Kong and not be allocated elsewhere in the world. What is the government doing to incentivize these family offices to, as much as possible, keep the money in Hong Kong or greater China? 
Mm. Um, I think Hong Kong is a very open society, and also what we want to do is to encourage and also facilitate family offices and also family wealth or other investors to use our financial and professional services for more. Be it either part their money here to invest in Hong Kong or the mainland, or they use their money elsewhere. So long as they use and also employ our financial services and professional services, we are happy. Uh, we had a really interesting story out, Christopher, yesterday about this lost generation of bankers in Hong Kong, where basically you've seen financial services activity has slowed. The IPO fundraising has basically been cut in half last year. It's hit VCs. It's, it's hit private equity in many ways. Job cuts all along the way uh, here in the city. And it seems like some of the things that were used to be the norm, you know, China's explosive growth, the ties between domestic and capital and global capital markets is looking more like a thing of the past. What do you think can turn around sentiment? Uh, I think what is unique about Hong Kong is that we are financial service centre, basically serving a, a scale at a scale which is uh, ten times even more of our GDP. Because after all, we are a city economy, and also we are a global financial centre which are serving clients from across the world. And you mentioned about crypto markets development and also how we be affected by uh, high interest rate and geopolitics. I think all these are something that we see no different from other jurisdictions. But that said, if you look at how Hong Kong has been faring in other areas, financial service. Services. Be it, uh, like, for example, in our uh, trading markets for ETFs, we see double digit growth, more than 20% growth in trade turnover. And also, at the same time, in the insurance market, we see uh, business growing for the uh, life segment, more than 30%. Yeah. And also, at the same time, if you look at uh, wealth management, for example, while we have gathered a very uh, solid base and also crowd of financial and also family offices interested to set up offices in Hong Kong. And recently, for example, we have launched our capital entrance scheme as I highlighted. So what is going to be set, setting Hong Kong apart from Singapore when it comes to this competition for family offices? What do you think is going to be the key, the key kind of swing factor for you guys? I think the key factor is our diversification in terms of what Hong Kong has to offer based on the breadth and depth of financial talent. Because if you look at Hong Kong, uh, our talent pool is far deeper and also broader than the rest of the world. And at the same time, our access to the mainland and also at the same time the breadth and sophistication of professional services is unique. And that's why we are very confident we are going to hit the target as you highlighted and also coupled with the various uh, mega events that we're hosting here including Wealth for Good and others we will definitely hit that. Uh, you mentioned about crypto how, how, how are you looking at you know what's been going on there how prepared do you think banks are when it comes to digital assets now? Mm. Um, we have been taking a uh, sustainable approach in terms of how we want to facilitate the growth of this market because after all if you look at many of the risk that this market has been posing it's very similar to conventional financial and also uh, other type of services and that's why the principle that we have adopting is very, is very simple which is should they present similar risk uh, we will subject them to similar regulation and this is something that we have done so far we have already starting to regulate the uh, virtual asset service providers which is the exchanges and also we will soon uh, regulate the virtual asset uh, OTC trading and it's something that we're going down the road try to make sure this sector can grow in a sustainable manner Christopher Christopher, I, I want to ask you about pri private markets and private capital and certainly direct lending, private credit has been an extremely hot asset class, private equity of course, and we have a, a number of well-established funds in Hong Kong. And, and I'm curious what, what you're seeing as far as the outlook for making Hong Kong at least some sort of base for private, so pr pr private money is concerned. Uh, in fact, we have been hearing a lot from our practitioners here in the region and globally in yeah. terms of what are measures that we can do to facilitate more private credit or other types of similar services development here in Hong Kong. And we are looking at some, some, some type of uh, tax arrangement in order to facilitate that. And it's something that we are looking into as a committee, going to chair by me, in terms of seeing any types of tax arrangement that we can do to facilitate that. Uh, what about what else you could bring to Hong Kong? I mean, there's been talk about not just crypto, bond futures, commodity futures. Is that something in, in Hong Kong's future as well? Yeah. Um, I think Hong Kong's strength has been well known and unique, and also something we will continue to build on as a connector between the mainland and also the international global markets. And it's something that we will continue to do and continue to deepen. And one thing you highlighted is in terms of the launch of the Chinese bond futures offshore through us uh, as a way to facilitate more risk management tools and arrangements 
arrangement for global investors to access the mainland bond market. And this is part and parcel of our overall strategy, really, to first of all grow the RMB international ecosystem through Hong Kong, at the same time to consolidate and solidify our role in the IFC.